All right, thank you everyone. We've got, we are ready for our next talk. We have a good friend of ours from MySec and besides Detroit, Wolfgang Gorlick, and he will be talking about aligning the threats and allies through stories. Come on up. Thanks. Hello, B-Side Chicago. Woohoo! All right. I got to keep it real close. I always fight with this microphone. I feel like I'm right up in front of it. This talk is aligning allies and threats through stories. Like, you know, the stories we told around the campfire, right? I think we all remember this campfire. Gathered nice and calm, blowing things up. Or maybe that was Dave Schwartzberg's Banana Foster. Either way, it was good. All right, my name's Wolfgang Gorlick. Like she said, I'm with MySec. I'm with B-Sides Detroit. I'm the VP of Viapoint. A lot of this talk comes from the things that I did in my last gig, actually, where I was a security officer and a DevOps manager for a financial services firm. And then as we've been ev uh, evolving our practice, doing it too with Viapoint. See, the thing is, as we all know, as security practitioners, the fundamental challenge is very simple. We are not the people of the keyboards, right? I mean, it's, it's easy to secure a system if you can configure it properly before they get to you. But we're not the ones there. We're not the ones making the choice. We are largely in the role of influencers. And we're trying to get ahead of the bad guys. We're trying to get ahead of the threats. And we're doing so by talking with the good guys, right? Talking to our peers on the firewall team so they can configure the port before the port scanners come from the script kiddies. Talking to our peers on the developer team so they can implement the SQL injection protection before they try and launch an attack against our website. Talking to our peers on you know, the compliance team to get third party risk assessment done before the threats try and pivot off of our third party to attack us. And it occurred to me, you know, defense is actually determined by the overlap of work between these two parties. So in other words, the, the tighter the overlap between the threats and our allies, the more defensible we are. It all basically boils down to alignment. It's really bright on that screen. So I had some early attempts in this, right? How do I get that alignment? How do I get the stakeholders to do the right thing before the allies get to, or before the bad guys get to us? And it's like, you go, know, you guys just have to do it. Level one, right? First year, I'm like, look, guys, I know what to do. Just do the right thing. They're like, yeah, 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 whatever. Look at compliance. I love compliance. You know, I can have a great story with the compliance people and say, we are doing this because we are PCI compliant. We will hit you with a HIPAA hammer if you do not tighten down that firewall. And that worked very well with some people, not so good with the other people. Uh, metrics is another one. I love metrics. Metrics are awesome. But it, it's interesting to me. So for example, you can take a, a vulnerability management metric, right? And you can give that metric to a CIO. Say it shows a backlog of work that needs to be done. And the CIO is like, that's awesome. Thank you. And he buys into it. And he throws resources at it. And he closes vulnerabilities. And I give that same metric to a very similar person in a very simpler company, but in a different company, right? And I get pushed back. And I don't get the buy-in. And that's that's not cool. So I looked at disaster recovery, you know, the, the, the whole asteroid falling from sky hits our data center, now we're safe because it's all molten glass. No one can get our data. We're safe. But it's also, disaster recovery is very cool in terms of like metrics and things because then I can cost justify an asset and I can say, okay, what is my single loss expectancy, my annualized loss expectancy, and what should I spend to protect this asset? And that worked phenomenal. That was a great story to tell to a CFO. And he's like, yeah, absolutely. We'll spend 10% of what's at risk to protect that. Good job, Wolf. And I tell that to someone else, maybe the, a CIO or whatever, and they're like, what are you even talking about? I looked at peer pressure, uh, rugged DevOps. So I was in the DevOps role, and I brought rugged up. I'm like, hey, look at this. This is awesome. We can all do the right thing here, guys. And they're like, yeah, let's do it. And they all got on board, and they're passionate, and they're applying security and as part of the build process, and we're getting better and better. I'm like, win. And then when I told that story, and uh, I shared it with my peer, very same organization, very same role. And uh, he goes and tries rugged with his team, and they push back. And he actually gets less security behavior because they are like, no, I don't even know what's wrong with you. 
So I looked at building security into projects and life cycles with this ongoing story, and it's very trivial to add a couple of things to the story to push it forward. But I finally got to the point where I'm like, ah, can we just social engineer the business for its own good? Tell me, please, what do I need to tell you to get you to do the right thing? Ah, it was very frustrating because sometimes something would work, and I'd be, that's awesome. And then I'd try that same thing again, and it wouldn't work. And I really didn't have a reference why tactics were not portable. And so I shared this with Stephen Fox. This is Stephen. Stephen's brilliant. He really is. Every time I talk to him, I learn something. A good example is we're putting together this deck. We both had like three titles. And I, he, I was like, all right, Stephen, you go first. What's your title? And he's like, my title for our B-Side Chicago talk is socialization and normalization of security behavior through modern modalities and cultural uh, touch points. That's, that's pretty good, Stephen. Um, and I'm kind of like hiding my list, you know. And he's like, so what's your list? I'm like, it doesn't matter. He goes, no, no, tell me, what's, what's your number one? I'm like, you really? And he's like, yeah. And I'm like, all right. Storytelling? Stephen's like, oh, okay, we'll, we'll come up to something. Because <laughs> he, always, he always stretches me, and I love that about him. And as you might notice, Stephen is not physically here with me, even though he's on the agenda. Um, bad for us, it's because he's out flying around. Good for us, it's because he got a promotion, and he's out flying around. But he, he was talking to me, he's like, look, Wolf, if you think about what works and what doesn't, and you abstracted a couple of layers, what you're actually talking about is branding. What you need to do is branding. And I thought, Stephen, that's brilliant. You're absolutely right. You round up the stakeholders. I'll light the fire. We're going to do this. <laughs> I love this idea. And he's like, no, no, Wolf, calm down. I'm like, no, I'm ready. He's like, no, no. I'm talking about marketing. And I go, OK, uh, that doesn't sound as exciting, but I'll go along. He's like, look, you're always talking about running information security like a business, which I am. I think that's very important. And he goes, when was the last time you marketed your information security function like a business? Good question. And Stephen put on a series of talks specifically about this and workshops. He called them From Obstacle to Ally, looking at the branding process and how it could be used to further the communication with stakeholders. And there's two things specifically we're going to pull out um, as we go through this process, and you'll see how we were plugged them in. Uh, that come directly from Stephen Fox. But ultimately, what Stephen made me understand is that stories drive behavior. Tell the right story to the right person at the right time, you get by and the security program moves forward. Tell the right story at the wrong time, or tell the wrong story to the right person, and you move backwards, right? And as we're trying to get that alignment, it's all about positioning those stories and acting on them. So today we're going to look at what we're calling story-driven security. We're going to look at it in three main parts. Um, stakeholder management, threat management, then I'm going to give you story-driven security as a whole, and then we'll give one example, and uh, then we'll wrap up and get you back to Beside Chicago. So let's start by looking at allies and stakeholders, right? This is the box. Everyone loves the box. Every time I'm talking to someone, they're like, we've got to be creative, we've got to think outside the box. I'm like, okay. That's awesome. But before we do that, let's <laughs> step back. How well do you understand your current situation? How well do we understand what the box actually is before we can think outside of it? As a matter of fact, let's step even back further. What does our company even do, right? What is our mission? What are we trying to support? What are the security functions we're performing to enable that mission? And on the branding side, how is the company messaging out that mission, right? What is the company's brand? And what does that brand tell us about that company? And what are the stories that are being told within that company about its brand and to its customers? Uh, great example. I mean, stories can really tell us a lot. So uh, real quick, I, <laughs> I was with a stakeholder, and he's like, Wolfgang, I'm glad you're on this project. We believe in compliance. So I'm like, awesome. That's a great place to start. He goes, let me tell you what I mean by that. He goes, I was in a meeting with an auditor and with my junior. And he goes, the auditor says, do you have a data center checklist? And I said, yes, I do. And the auditor's like, that's great. Let's go see it. So the senior steps up. He gives a wink and a nod to the junior. He takes the auditor out the long way, stops for Danish, right, gets some coffee, loads the scenic route. Meanwhile, the junior, he's just like, 
booking it, right? He's like running and jumping. I got imagine him like, you know, jumping over cue balls and picking up a piece of paper here and picking up a pen there and a clipboard there. And he slides into the data center, hangs it on the wall, signs his name in, and walks out just as the senior guy rounds the corner with the auditor. And with a nod and a flourish, the senior guy opens the door and says, see, auditor, here's our checklist. <laughs> and my stakeholder goes, and that's just-in-time compliance, and that's what we want your help with. That story told me probably more than I needed to know about the level of maturity in his company and what we were actually doing for him. Uh, stories are very important. So we had some music in the interim. I loved it. Uh, they're trying to get me to do Gangnam Style dancing. I'm not going to do that. Uh, sorry. But you may be wondering at this point, you know, what would the fox say? That song gets stuck in my head. Bad pun, I know. Bad pun. I know, I know. But so Stephen Fox would say, if he was here with us, that the brand is an emergent property of the organization. The brand comes from its constituent parts. Put differently, we can actually reverse engineer where our stakeholders are, what they want, what they're trying to do, by looking at the brand and the stories and working backwards. And that becomes very important as we're trying to assess what stories we need to tell to drive the right behavior. It's things like brand assets, right? That makes sense. You know, your logo and whatnot, your colors and your team flags. It's also market opportunity. What, with that mission, are we trying to accomplish? And what is our market segment? It's also, of course, the target audience. Who are we speaking to? And these form what Stephen calls the uh, a branding triad with brand assets, market opportunity, and target audience. Now, here is the key leap, right? This is all like marketing 101, but here's the key leap I want you guys to make with me. It's not just our organization's brand. That's really what people look at, right? The four logo, what have you. Let's take it one step further. It's our stakeholders' brand, right? Their personal brand and their team brand. When I told you guys that I had a lot of success with Rugged DevOps, um, Josh Corman's program, he shared it with me, we looked at it, I presented it to my team. That success stemmed from their brand, right? They embraced it because they saw it as a way of making themselves look better and doing better work. It was very much congruent with their personal brand. And if you think about when things don't work, that's often the reason why. And it's also, of course, our team brand and our personal brand and creating stories and messages that go move from personal to team to stakeholder all the way through the organization by maintaining alignment across these dimensions. Now, of course, branding is all fine and good, but we also need to look at that strategy, that mission. What is the organization's mission? And, of course, what is our stakeholder's mission? The example with the metrics to our CIO, if we give a CIO whose strategy is to add staff metrics that show that we've got a lot of backlog, of course we're going to get by, and we are basically giving him everything he needs to achieve his mission, right? To sell the fact he needs more staff. But yet if we give those same metrics to someone who's trying to demonstrate efficiency, it's no wonder we're getting pushback because we're saying, look, your team's inefficient, you need more people. Understanding what uh, their mission is and what their brand is allows us to tell them the right thing at the right time. And of course, this all ultimately gets back to what we're trying to do. We're trying to improve ourselves, we're trying to improve our team, we're trying to improve the security posture of the organization, and maintaining alignment through all those. And that, in and of itself, is the box. And Schrodinger's cat. All right, so let's talk a little bit about threat management. So threat management starts ultimately at, why does it matter, right? What is the relevance to the organization? This is very much a business continuity concept, right? What is the relevance of this particular attack? When I was at the financial, I cared very much about someone attacking my trading system. I could not care less, really, if they attacked my website, because it's not going to impact my mission. And knowing what that relevance is allows us to make sure that we're focusing our attention in the right place. But it's also attacker's objectives. Uh, I had a great talk. You know, as part of my sec, we talked to a lot of people, and this guy's out here is like, look, I'm really concerned. All right, all right, let's talk about it. He goes, I'm really concerned about the rogue hackers from other nations, and they're going to steal my data. Like, I can see why. Um, but you're a library, <laughs> and you're on Windows XP. Let's dial it back a little bit and uh, focus in on something that's probably a little bit more likely for an attacker to do to you. Like phishing? I don't know. So 
keeping something that's very business relevant and keeping something that's very likely from an attacker perspective. And then we can look at the attack path, the path the attacker is going to take through our controls, through our organization to achieve that objective. And then how we're going to communicate that out, what stories we're going to tell. This forms um, what we're calling an abuse case. So you're thinking like in software development, you have a use case, right? This is the same concept. An abuse case contains things like why does it matter to the business, why does it matter to the attacker, what the attack is, and what the controls we're going to put in place are, and how we're going to communicate them and act upon that. Now, before I get too far, I just want to do the you know, like standard like Coke or Pepsi thing, right? So don't Coke or Pepsi me. Um, your brand is your brand, and I'm glad you love it. Because if you're doing threat modeling today, you probably really love the threat model you're using. Uh, and, and if you're not, well, then use mine because it's awesome. Um, but no. So I tried Stride. I love Stride when I'm doing application development, right? So Stride allows you to take a look at a feature and look at everything from spoofing all the way down to elevation of privilege and say, okay, how would this really be misused? Awesome. A lot of work and not necessarily relevant to business case. Um, level threat modeling. Looked at attack trees. I love attack trees. You know, show me all the different paths the attacker may take. Fantastic. Very difficult for me to give to an IT manager and say, look, see this branch right here? That's what you need to address. And they've got this huge long list that, again, work. If it looks, work looks like work, it gets done. If it doesn't look like work, it doesn't. So an IT manager is like, yeah, can you put that in Excel? Yeah, okay, we'll get you. Um, there's kill chains, awesome, trademarked, etc. And then what we've been developing in my sec is attack paths. And I think attack paths have finally made it. We've been using it for a long time. And I, our metric of success, I heard, was if we could get Eve Adams to give a talk spoofing on the name attack paths. That's how we know the, the model's been, been good. And looking at the agenda, I, I think today is attack paths day. But anyways, I digress. So. Real quick, I know Belt covers some of this, so I'm just going to whiz by this. But attack path is very simple. You break an attack into the logical steps, right? Similar to kill chain, what is the attacker really doing? But the key point with attack paths is to look at the nouns. Or I'm sorry, not look at the nouns, not look at the tools, right? We got fantastic stuff to look at tools. IDS signatures, IBS signatures, antivirus, blah, blah, blah. And each one of these, you've probably seen, we can easily also walk around. As an industry, we tend to be very obsessed with tools. And uh, the, the recent information that came out uh, was a perfect example of that, right? So there's a notice that, you know, Snowden used WGET. Oh, no. And within 24 hours, this was fantastic and really a, a sign of our industry. Within 24 hours, our friends at Checkpoint were like, no worry, bro, we can stop WGET. That's awesome. It looks at the user agent string. So people who are using WGET and really don't know how to like slash question mark and slash user agent will be stopped. We will stop them and it'll be awesome. Moreover, obviously the problem with every tool based solution is it's very tool specific. So okay, W gets being stopped. Oh, I know, why don't we use curl or whatever the next tool is. See, tools do not work well for that very reason. Uh, another guy we know from my second, he's like, look, uh, this happened a couple years ago. He was in charge of an RFP for antivirus. Big, big organization, big RFP. And uh, he had recently got breached, and he had the script that did the breach, and he had some malware dropper, and he went out to all the antivirus vendors, and like, you guys all suck, you can't detect this, but we need to, we need to figure out what antivirus we're going to use. And uh, he's like, help me. And pre-sales is like, we'll help you. And one enterprising young guy in pre-sales took the script, went away for a couple weeks, came back, and said, oh, have you updated the antivirus on our test network? Yes. Good. Can we re run that scan against that sample you found? Because we upgraded our uh, our analytics. So they rerun it, and wow, we caught the mailer dropper. Nice, nice use of tools. So our our friend is no fool. He opens up the VB script. He adds a couple comments, adds a couple characters, returns, saves it, reruns it, and of course, the antivirus gets through. He's like, awesome. Thank you for stopping me from being attacked by people who don't know how to open VB scripts. That's awesome. 
So we are safe with tools against people who do not know how to edit VB scripts or run command line help for wget. Um, with attack paths and with the stories, we really need to move beyond that, right? We need to look at the tactics, the high-level verbs um, that's being performed. Use a tool to script download things, right? Using verbs and using tactics that are high level enough that we can explain to senior level technologists, director and C level, what needs to happen and what's going on. Now, I'll give you an example of this towards the end. And then, of course, we can lay on our controls how we're going to stop that. And then we can exercise it, right? So we've got our control, we've got our exercise, we're going to run it and see what happens and create that evidence in a way that looks like work to an IT person to make sure that the security operations people can see it, can respond, and do what needs to happen. So if you guys saw my incog talk that I did, um, that's exactly what I built. I built one of those for data exfiltration over PowerShell, and, and now I'm really excited to see the PowerShell framework, so I'm thinking I can plug that in. It's going to be pretty cool. But let's take a look at what this looks like. So the number one uh, threat that I was facing in the financial was malware, right? Not the sexy, exciting stuff, but like 95% of our attacks were all malware. So here's a very simple malware threat model working down, filling out the high-level tactics that the malware would follow. And then we flip it on its side and we work back up to add in our detective controls. This down and up is pretty, pretty important, right? Because if you think about it, last time you had a meeting, what are there seven tactics here? Last time you had a meeting with an agenda with seven items, how much time in one hour was dedicated to those seven items? I will bet you that 45 minutes were spent on the first two or three items, right? And they were like, oh, we got some more items. Okay, whoa, 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 whoa. 15 minutes, low energy, low attention spent in the last. So working bottom up is very important because the closer we are to the objective, the closer we are to the end, the clearer the signal intelligence, the more important it is to stop the attacker. So we make use of the very human way we organize meetings to run the threat model. And then once we have that, we can work back down and go ahead and create our exercise. Again, creating work that looks like work. So if we say our control is we will stop or respond to local administrator accounts, our exercise is, hey, create a local administrator account. And they're like, all right, we did. Did we respond? Let's find out what was the action. Now, this can tell us some interesting information, right, about things like defense in depth. I love defense in depth. I often say defense in depth is dead <laughs> because it, it, it separated from actual attacks, which is how many of us are when we're in IT, um, how do we really know our defense is deep, right? I talk to nine out of 10 IT guys and I say, how deep is your defense? And they're like, our defense is deep and littered with the bones of our enemies. <laughs> well, yours actually is, you don't count. Um, but the rest of us, why do we think that? Well, we think that because, hey, as an IT manager, I'm paying Joe, and Joe's doing, you know, 37 hours a week doing defense in depth. I know my defense in depth is deep. It's like, okay, that's right, right on. Um, good example of this, we, we did a pet test. It was, it was great. Um, sitting down with the director of IT, and we were talking about a bunch, bunch of things, and pen test was going, and finally he turns to me and goes, you know what, any minute now it's going to happen. What's going to happen? He goes, any minute now our trap is going to spring and we're going to get your guy dead to rights. Okay, I'll play along. Uh, can you tell me more? He's like, all right, but don't tell him. This is awesome. What we did was we created this administrator account with a really small password. Okay, tell me more. He's like, yeah, and we told no one to log in at it and all our logging is set on that account. So when he tries to brute force, he will get that really quick because it's just a four-digit password and then he'll log in and all our logging will come and we'll catch him, right? Deep and litter with the bones of our enemies. And I believe that as an IT guy, that would make really good sense to me like two or three years ago until I started hanging out with all you fine folks and, uh, and realizing that, you know, maybe our defense really isn't as deep as we thought. <laughs> it seemed really good when I was working on it. Um, so what's interesting is that, that pen test, they, my guy never touched that account, right? So pen testers in the room know this. How, how likely are you to pass the hash versus crack a password? What's easier? Pass the hash, right? So we've set up an account where we've told no one to log in, which means there's no hash. What are we, what are we gonna do as a you know, attacker? We're gonna grab that guy who's logged in over there checking his email and 
browsing the web and use his account and compromise the whole network. And that's exactly what we did. See, defense in depth, it's not dead, but it's relative, right? Defense in depth is relative to a use. And so if we take threat model and we say we have seven tactics and we can detect maybe nine of them and prevent maybe six of them, we can begin to form a metric, an idea of how effective that actual defense is. And it's important to have as many controls as possible, right? Because controls fail, controls don't work, things are missed. And, and what's worse is attackers don't follow the script. I love this idea if I could just like say, okay, listen, we've threat modeled this and here's how I want you to attack me and if you could do it like on Wednesday because that's when everyone's in the office, that'd be awesome. Thank you. But they don't. They, it's so inconsiderate. Uh, so this allows us to, to build a good security program for a specific attack, a specific threat. So that's stakeholder management. That's threat management, threat modeling. I'm now going to jump into story-driven security and give you an example. Story-driven security is all about starting with a meaningful attack. What are people actually concerned about? When are people contacting us and saying, hey, are we protected against this? Do you know someone is? Have you seen? And then I heard on the news, what are we going to do? And coming to us and starting there. Now, every time I say that on Twitter, someone trolls me. Actually, every time I say anything on Twitter, someone trolls me. Uh, but I want to address this point really carefully. Stories are not FUD, right? Stories are saying that someone is afraid there's uncertainty and there's doubt, and they're coming to us. And we're going to use threat modeling and use some techniques to clear the uncertainty and leverage that doubt to then address and be prepared. Very key point, stories are not FUD. With those stories, we can threat model, and then we can go ahead and start being prepared. Now, here's a different threat model. This is an insider threat, right? So we said, OK, they're going to move throughout the network, they're going to try and log in with an old account, they're going to try and get some files, they're going to exfiltrate data. All right, now that we have this, we can go ahead and do a tabletop exercise, right, to determine the real risk. No one ever laughs at this joke, but it's a game of risk. Okay. Anyways, so we can determine the real risk. And this is awesome because, again, IT people by default, and I'm speaking from experience as being a lifelong IT person, we don't know how you're actually going to attack us. So we can get the IT people with the SecOps people and we can say, look, here's what the attack really looks like. What defense do we have really along these lines? And maybe we look at it and we see, hey, we got a lot of things in place, but we're missing a lot of ideal detection and prevention. That's what those highlighted bars are. So we can identify some improvements out of that, right? So we can tell the story, hey, so-and-so brought us this problem. It was a very serious problem. Here's why it mattered to us. Here's why it's likely. And we've looked at it, and here's our needs for improvement. So out of this example, maybe we had five that we could detect and seven we could prevent. And there's some really cool things that we could do with SharePoint logging, exchange logging. Well, thinking back to projects, that's awesome. Oh, you're upgrading your exchange? You're upgrading your SharePoint? Yeah, you remember that threat model we looked at? Could you just like spend an hour out of that, uh, you know, 640 hour project to, to just implement the logging? Sweet. Maybe it's something like uploading lots of data, maybe we need to put a SIM rule in place, whatever it is. But now that we know what it is and we can start looking for ways to leverage what's going on in the organization, we can build our communication and action plan. And here's where Steven's thinking comes into play again. See, we need to think about audience power, of course. Who are we telling that story to? And not just traditional power, like I've told the CIO and the CIO will fix it. No, I mean like, all right, so for example, uh, on my last team, probably the most uh, powerful person from a story perspective was, uh, was my storage guy. I loved my storage guy. He was also our token extrovert, so you can kind of probably line those two up. But he, if I wanted anyone to know anything, I told my storage guy and he spread it everywhere. Everyone knew, it was awesome. So. Not only who has power, but also who has influence and who can spread the message. But when we give that message is important. You know, I, I watch junior guys and they're like, oh, we got a problem, we got a problem. And they tell them right when they find the problem. And sometimes it works great and other times not so well. And after a while you're like, hey, do you notice when it's working well? No, not really. I mean, Patch Tuesday happens and then we go, we got a problem and they're not really receptive. Like, okay. Do me a favor, wait till after the 15th of the month and try it again. 
And they go, we got a problem. It's the 15th of the month. They go, ah, we've got time to help you. When? But it's also, that's, so that's like avoiding the bad time. It's also the good time, right? So here's a good example. Let's suppose um, a problem has come to us from someone in compliance. And we know the general counsel is about to speak to the board, right? And we know the general counsel has got some things going on. And with his brand and strategy, this board presentation is very important. And what he really wants to echo is how well he's protecting the organization. So let's suppose we know that. And we go to him and say, hey, look, you know your guy? He is awesome. And I'll tell you why he's awesome. He's awesome because he identified this problem with us and he worked with our security team. He's awesome because he sat in on this tabletop and he found that we need these four things in place so we can protect the organization. He's awesome because you know that thing that everyone's hearing about and everyone's talking about? Yeah, he worked with us to fix that. So now the GC goes to the board, he's got a story, he tells that story, and you better believe that guy's got buy-in to help us fix that, right? All the way down. Awesome, awesome timing. And it's all about the benefits, driving the benefits of that story and positioning that story to make use of all those dimensions. And that's uh, Stephen Fox's positioning diagram. And then it goes back to storytelling, right? We position the story, now we need to tell the story. We need to tell a story that's consistent and authentic. We need to tell a story that is up to uh, our own professional ethics. We need to just tell the story in a way that makes bold promises about securing the environment. And it is also subtle about who's doing the work and how it's getting done and what the overall plan is. We need to tell the story to that specific audience, the right person, at the right time and in the right way so we can get the right action out of it. And that's how we really take a, a, a threat model, an attack path, and we take this attack path and we make it a very useful vehicle for telling these stories and creating this buy-in without the organization. Now, once we have these controls in place, we need to exercise it, right? We need to do something. And if you think about like risk as our tabletop, I like to think of like the human mouse trap, right? As our security exercise. You got the ball and it drops and it springs over here and then it rolls down this thing and it's in the tub and the tub flips and now it's over here and that's my, that's like the perfect security exercise. I love security exercises. How many things can we break and click and do? The important thing again though is that security exercises should look like work. Should look like normal work to normal IT people and they should be things that seem like real risk. So if you take one of these things, so for example, um, we're concerned about an insider threat logging into Active Directory uh, as an ex-employee when their account's been disabled. Well, that's our control, Active Directory logging. And our exercise is log into that disabled account. That's something very easy for an IT ops person to do. Now. Warning, warning, exercises do not equal, right, elite hacker techniques. It's all about making it simple. It's all about testing a control and building a story. And these stories, once they're coached in this way, um, they're seen as being less risk, they're seen as being less time intensive, and therefore they can be repeated more often. And as a matter of fact, uh, we, one person we know, whenever they implement a change, they actually have created run books with these threat models where they just create an account, move a file, copy some stuff, do this thing. So whenever there's a change in the organization, they can immediately run back through their threat models and make sure their security posture hasn't weakened. Very, very useful. Very exciting to me because I like seeing the ball jump around through the mouse trap. All right, so for example, for example, my last example, here we go. Uh, brief warning. Trigger warning, I'm sorry. But let's suppose you're in a target rich environment. I know we're in a bar, so if anyone's playing buzzword bingo, there you go, target. I don't think I've said APT yet, but we can do like cyber cyber big data and you guys can have a great night. <laughs> so target is one of those things that we're all sick and tired of hearing about, but Target is also one of those things that are phenomenal. Why? Because people are still reading about it. People are coming off and doing what I call like the sky mall driven security, right? They land the plane and the executive emails and says, hey, I was just hearing about Target. What, what are we doing about that? Are we safe? You know? And it's great because it gives us an ability to say, okay, if I'm in retail, that is a meaningful attack for me. So let's make sure that if I'm in retail, I'm responding to this and I'm communicating it up since we're getting asked questions about it. So real quick, like layout of the target timeline, because it'll come into play with the threat model. So you guys may have been following this or not, this is a simplified version, but basically what happened was the attacker stole credentials from an HVAC company, 
you know, they did a phishing attempt or whatever, they stole target credentials from that company. They use those credentials, again, the whole mousetrap thing, they use those credentials to log into a billing system as a website. And from that website, there was a flaw on the website that they leveraged that allowed them to pivot through that billing system onto the network. Now they're in the network, happy as can be, and they're scanning around. And they found, lo and behold, there's this fantastic IT management software. So BMC, it pushes out patches. It's great. Um, it's even better from attacker perspective if it's configured with default credentials. Because if you find it, you can now log into it. So you can see how that went. Uh, so now the attacker, using HVAC creds, connects to a website, sets up a proxy, goes through that website, connects to BMC. Using BMC, goes, oh, I can push out a patch pushes out malware, black POS, to all the point of sale systems. Win, doesn't get detected, right? All the ports are already open, everything's already set. Compromises a whole bunch of uh, systems and then starts scraping the RAM out for credit card data. Credit card data is, is collecting, collecting, collecting the point of sale systems that's sent back to the management server and at some point in time, 11 gigs, 11 gigs of our credit card information, mine included, um, are sent back over FTP to the attackers. Now, that's like the, the, the target story, right? But we gotta remember, we need to abstract this up a layer. Because otherwise, what's gonna happen is, and I swear, because I would do this if I was an IT side. Someone's like, you're in retail. I'm like, all right, I'm in retail. And they're like, and you're using BMC software with default creds. I'm like, no, I'm not. I'm using System Center, I'm safe. And the rest of the whole conversation shut down, right? So we really need to raise it up above and look at the big picture. So maybe it's things like, okay, the tactics would be compromising a third party vendor, connecting internal web sources, um, compromising those web sources, pivoting on internal networks, scanning, um, connecting to IT management with default creds, tactics, not verbs, things that are high level, things that will be applicable to a wide variety of environments. And then we can threaten all this out and again, tabletop it and identify a whole bunch of improvements. You can see here, they're pretty much screwed. Yeah. So we can say, okay, hey, what if we had 2FA on that portal? That would have stopped it. What if we had like uh, alerts for FTPing out? That would have stopped it. Those types of things. But we may also go through that exercise and go, hey, you know what? We're actually pretty good because we've got network segmentation. No one could compromise this website and pivot onto the management network and pivot onto the point of sale system. Awesome, perfect exercise, right? If you only got one or two controls holding the attacker at bay, that's what we want to exercise, and that's exactly what we would do in this example. Now, another caution, another warning. Uh, we don't want to teach to the test. This is another thing that I see happening when we do threat model. They're like, okay, so they're gonna move this narrow path, and as long as we stop, there's this narrow path. You know, attackers, they just, they, they don't do that, right? You know, so, um, at one point in time, I had an outsourced data center and outsourced security. And uh, this was a time Anonymous was attacking a whole bunch of websites and I saw something weird. And I picked them up, I'm like, hey, we are outsourced security and like this. We do. Good, I need the logs. No problem, sir. Um, when do you want them? Like right now? Oh, I'm sorry, it doesn't work that way. Okay, how does it work? Like, well, we need you to put in a 48 hour notice and we can log for eight hours. That's awesome. And I was so jealous. I'm like, your guys' customers are so great. I want their attackers. My attackers won't even give me a heads up. Theirs are like putting in change control tickets. That's phenomenal. Attackers don't do what we expect, right? They don't come when we expect. They don't look like what we expect. And we want to make sure that these threat models are broad enough so that if the attack goes a little bit left, a little bit right, we still stand a good chance of catching them. And that's my target example again. Buzzword bingo, apologies, or you're welcome, depending on if you've hit the bar. Uh, <laughs> let's summarize this, we'll wrap this up. Story-driven security, effectively, is about operationalizing threat modeling and operationalizing security exercises. But to do that, to do that, we need to know our audience. We need to know what they want, we need to know what's important to them, and we need to know our attackers, how they're really gonna come at us, how those attacks are really going to look like, and how they would stack up against our controls.
We do these threat models. We can bring in our IT ops. We can use them as training exercises to teach our IT operations people that their defense in depth for a given threat is probably a little bit shallower than they thought it was. And we can help them as they're building new projects and new initiatives to raise the water level, right? To raise that defense in depth. And in doing so, we can tell the story. We can tell the story about how someone found this. We can tell the story about the firewall admin who had the right control. We can tell the story about the developer who had the foresight to be prepared. We can tell the story about the third party monitoring program that probably wasn't getting, a risk management program that probably wasn't getting the love that maybe it, it should have that would have stopped the target breach. You know, those types of things that we can celebrate. And this is the key point, actually probably the key point of this entire talk. If you forget everything else I said today, remember this one. Who is the hero of our story? Right, we're like, I'm the hero. Right, we're the hero, we're in security. No, sorry, wrong answer. Story-driven security is all about making our stakeholder the hero, right? It's all about promoting them and their objectives, and in doing so, improving our security and where we stand. So we, we build the story, we tell the story, we recognize there's needs for improvements. To get these improvements made, we gotta get the buy-in, we gotta implement controls, and then when we get the controls in place, we execute an exercise that looks just like normal work from a IT perspective. Execute the exercise that creates the evidence without introducing the malware. Execute the exercise that that evidence then can be followed through to make sure that people are responding correctly, and that our SLAs from our SecOps team are being met. And again, we can tell the story. And again, the stakeholder's the hero. I mean, we all want to be the hero. We all want to be Jimmy Vo. <laughs> but the stakeholder's our hero. I want to be Jimmy Vo, I admit it. So that's story-driven security in a nutshell. This is all about taking the, the branding parameters of our organizations, our stakeholders, our teams, ourselves, the strategy parameters, again, of our organizations, our teams, ourselves, and aligning those and positioning stories that influence behavior across those chains so that the right controls are in place before the attackers come. One last thing, I've seen like three great ways, three great ways, three levels of the story-driven technique. And I want to share them with you and then I'll wrap up. Um, level one is like obtaining action on the stories because the organization has to. Yeah, it makes sense, right? We got PCI, we got HIPAA, we got whatever it may be. Level one is saying, okay, here's our controls and we're communicating these. You know you have to do this. This is really part of your normal work. Here's what it looks like. That's level one. And it can be very, very effective depending on how you manage scope and whatnot, especially in the early days of a program. But level two, level two better, as we're telling stories about how we're implementing compliance and maybe we're avoiding fines and we're driving behavior and we're spreading the word about how great it is to work with the security people, uh, which is literally something I've heard, how great it is to work with the security people. Um, level two is now they want to work with us, right? They want to do these controls because they do want to be the hero of the story. They do want to be Jimmy Vo. They do want to be out there. They're like, yeah, what can I do? What are you doing? Are you doing a threat model this quarter and, and what's my part in it? And that's awesome. That's really good. But level three, level three, the best in my mind is when we create situations where our stakeholders through this process are building their brand, are furthering their strategy, are getting what they need to get done by doing security tasks, right? They're, they already want to be awesome developers. We're just giving them rugged. The CIO already wants to hire someone. We're just helping them build that business case with vulnerability management, right? Three levels. They have to, they want to help you, and actually we are helping them. We are really, at that point in time, becoming security team of enablers. That's, uh, that's not always possible, but that is the best in my mind. So that's how we take stakeholder management. Who are the people? What do they care about? What are they trying to do and how can we help them? We take threat management. Who are the bad guys? How do they actually behave? What really matters to them and what are they after us for? And we align those two to drive change. In a life cycle, I'll share the life cycle with you really quick. Here's what it looks like. It's very simple. It's probably the very first thing that we were all taught growing up. <laughs> we listen. And it's back up, guys. Yay! See, I was listening. There you go. 
All right, so let's back up. So in a life cycle, story-driven security, we listen. We listen to what they want, right? We listen to the attacks, and we listen to the people, and we listen to the stories. And we threat model those attacks, so we know what it looks like, and we know how to be prepared. We get buy-in to drive the controls. We exercise those controls, and each step of the way, we're sharing stories and building buy-in and building good momentum, and we're celebrating those successes, and then we're rinsing and repeating month after month, quarter after quarter, year after year, driving a security program forward. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is story-driven security. That, ladies and gentlemen, is how we get alignment, we get buy-in, and we create a security culture where we're actually pushing the organization forward. I'm out of time. Hit me up for questions afterwards. I'm going to leave my contact up. Have a great piece of Chicago.